Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is October 14th, 2022. This video is called Offended at Christ. This video is born out of my own experience over the past year. It's been a really difficult uh, year for me and for my wife with uh, incredible sickness um, that I won't go into the details of, but basically my wife has been sick for about 15 months and I've been sick for about 11 months. And as much as we have prayed, God has not healed us. And we've had to go to, uh, we go to naturopathic doctors for help with the issues that we're having and do everything that we can not to go to the uh, establishments of Babylon for our uh, medical care. So one of the reasons why it's been so frustrating is we read, you know, my wife and I, we read the scripture all the time um, daily and Psalm 103 was brought to our attention bless I am O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless I am O my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity who heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. That's the first five verses of Psalm 103. Well, surely you see what I'm going to talk about here. This says, who heals all your diseases. Well, he hasn't healed my disease. He hasn't healed my wife's disease. We continue to um, do things that we hope will heal our disease in the natural. And that's very frustrating to us, especially as we have been looking so diligently for the manifestation of the sons of God and for the kingdom of God to begin to rule in this earth. And as I considered all of this lately, I realized I'm offended at God. I'm offended because he hasn't healed me. And so I began to look for scriptures that were dealing with being offended at God. Is there such a scripture? Well, yes, there is. And uh, we're going to go to that now. Matthew 11. Verse 1, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When I first read that, I thought, wow, that's strange. What a place for that verse to be. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Who's he talking to? talking to John. John the Baptist gave up everything his entire life for the Christ for Jesus. 
And here he is sitting in prison. And he doesn't know what's going to happen to him, but he's in prison. And, you know, that's not a nice place to be. And he doesn't know that his head is about to be cut off. And Jesus sent back the message to John. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Matthew eleven seven. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? Did you go out to see a reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? To go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist had seen the dove coming upon Jesus, the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus when he baptized him. John the Baptist had heard about the miracles Jesus had done and was doing. But he was in a hard place. And he wondered, is this really the Christ? How can this really be the Christ when my life is shattered. My life is being taken away from me. How can this be the Christ? That reminds me of something my wife said to me a few years ago. She said concerning the world and where we are in the world, she said, Lord, if I were God, this would all be over by now. And immediately, the Lord spoke to her and said, that's why you're not God. God has a purpose for the sufferings that we go through in this world. If you have not read the book, A Tale of Two Cities, by Charles Dickens, you need to read it. I've never seen anyone really tell others what A Tale of Two Cities is about. I'm not going to, going to spoil the book for you if you haven't read it, but let me just say a couple things to help you as you read it. A Tale of Two Cities is a parable of Jesus Christ. And A Tale of Two Cities, everyone will tell you, is about the two cities, London and Paris, at the time of the French Revolution. And yes, of course, London and Paris are mentioned in the book, but that's not what the book is about. The book is about the two cities, a tale of two cities, the city of man, that the Bible calls Babylon the Great, and the city of God, that the Bible calls New Jerusalem. And the book is a parable of Jesus Christ. Amazing, amazing book. 
It's my son Jared's favorite novel, and it has become mine as well. Well, let's look at some other scriptures that will help us through this dilemma. How can, how can we get through life when life is so hard? It reminds me of, of how hard it is. Um, my life is nothing compared to the hardness that it was to the French people who rose up under the tyranny of their rulers at the time of the French Revolution. And our lives are, are not nearly as hard as they were under many, many different periods of time in history of incredible persecution. Just think, for example, of the time that the Romans came and killed all of the children under age two at the time that Jesus was born. Let's go to John chapter 6. Six fifty one, Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, or Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Always pay close attention to the times when those words appear in the book of John. Amen, Amen, or truly, truly, or verily, verily. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Do you feed on Christ? What does that mean? Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. This bread is Jesus' word. We have to be filled with the word. We have to wash ourselves with the word. The word becomes oil and wine within us. It becomes living within us, a fire within us. You burn oil to make fire. Now, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Are you offended by me? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Verse 65, and he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. 
So, yes, this is a hard walk. But as Peter said, where else could we go? You learn from experience when you walk with God for many years, as I have, that there is nowhere else to go. There is no one else who has the words of eternal life. There are many imposters out there. There are many people who think they know, who have a little bit of truth, who know a little bit about what's going on in the world, and who think that you can somehow vibrate your way up to ascendancy I've even seen a lot of Christians using that terminology today. Their vibration is increasing. You know, speak scripture, don't speak what the New Age false prophets say. Speak the truth. We're not vibrating up. We are in birth pains. We are in labor. We are about to die. The world is crumbling around our feet, and we see it. Unfortunately, many Christians don't see it yet. They don't realize the time that we live in. And suddenly, when the trap is sprung, they will understand, and it will be too late, because they will not have extra oil within them. You may be offended, but keep drinking the water. Keep eating the bread. Keep filling yourself with the oil of God. Keep filling yourself. Let that water be turned into wine, just as Jesus did in this first miracle in John chapter 2. Let the water within you be turned into wine, let the water be turned into oil that will burn. There is nowhere else to go. Where else can you go? Let's understand why that's true. Go to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11. For I am spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me. And warn me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. We live in a day of fear. Fear covers the earth, and the powers that be do everything they can to make us afraid. Constantly. Right now, what's the great fear? Nuclear destruction. Famine. Gas shortages. No heat for the winter. Fear. Constant fear. But I am of hosts. Him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. And let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary. And a stone of offense. And a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel. A trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken and they shall be snared and taken. Jesus is the stumbling stone. Everybody wants to do it themselves. Everybody thinks they can be good within themselves. That they're not bad people. They're good people. They want to be responsible for their own salvation. But there is only one way to salvation. And that is through Jesus. There is only one perfect. Why do you call me good? Jesus said to the rich young ruler. There is only one good. 
only one good God. There is only one good. Why do you call me good? Well, it just so happened that Jesus was good. He is good. But there is only one good, and you're not that one. I'm not that one. We have to go to the stone of offense. Now he's a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel. What are those houses? The northern tribes that were called Israel is now the church. The southern tribe of Judah remained Judah, the Jews. Now it so happens that the New Testament teaches us that a true Jew is one who believes that Jesus Christ is his king. But nevertheless, the Jews as a people still exist. And they are one of the houses of Israel and the church is the other house. But most in those houses still stumble over the stumbling stone. And when people really get to know the words of God, they become offended because it's not an easy walk. Isaiah 8, 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. This is why Peter said, where else can we go? No one else has the testimony and no one else has the law. I'm going to continue reading this part and then talk about it a little, a little more. I will wait for the Lord. I will wait for I am who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. God has been hiding his face from me, and God has been hiding his face from my wife for a long time. And I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from I am of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. This is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2. And when they say to you, Inquire of mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. Should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no light in them. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against the their king and their God, and turn their faces upward, and they will look to the earth, but behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. We live at this time of thick darkness. Many people will go to those who are speaking by demonic spirits instead of by the Spirit of God. Even Christians, Christian prophets who speak by an evil spirit. If you've been paying attention to, to the prophets over the last few years, you will see that they have been dreadfully wrong about everything. The prophet of God has to speak the word of God. He doesn't speak words that tickle the ears and he doesn't speak words that come from 
demonic spirits because he tests them and he aligns them with the word of God. Now there is a time coming very soon. And I'll just take you to this scripture here. I still have it in my mind to teach on this and I think I'll go ahead and teach a little bit um, now concerning it. The last time I was speaking on being born of water, I taught from John chapter 8. At the end of that, Jesus says, Again, it's um, one of the amens. Amen, amen. Truly, truly. John eight fifty eight. When the Jews said to him in verse 57, You're not 50 years old yet, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly. Amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He declared himself God right then. Verse 59, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. You can't say it any more clearly than that. Before Abraham was, I am. Well, then verse 9. Or chapter 9. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Night is coming when no man can work. And now let's go back here to Isaiah 8. Verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no light in them. They have no light in them. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. And they will be thrust into thick darkness. Night comes when no man can work. This is the time that Isaiah is talking about in chapter 8. And then go on into chapter 9. Most people will stop at 8 because how can 9 be relevant to this? So they will be thrust into thick darkness. That's the last verse of chapter 8. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. <clears throat> That's chapter 9, verse 1. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. <clears throat> Who's in anguish? The woman. The woman is in anguish who is about to give birth to the man-child. That woman is in anguish right now. And that is why many are offended right now because the time is so difficult. The labor is so difficult. Because we're not seeing the miracles of God yet. And why not? Because if we were, we'd be out doing them and it would be before the time. So there's a reason why 
we're not seeing manifestations of power and manifestations of glory because it's not yet the time. Isaiah 9 now is going to tell us what we will see when this occurs. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tromping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Well, everyone, of course, knows that this refers to Jesus, the Christ. And we certainly hear that in the wonderful music by Handel, the Messiah. But is that, was that the full fulfillment of this scripture? Did the first coming of Jesus fulfill this? Verse 4, 9, 4 says, The yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. See, Jesus did not break the yoke of the oppressor. He did not destroy Rome. He did not come against the powers at that time. In fact, he allowed those powers to kill him, to crucify him. This was one of the reasons why the people at that time were so offended at Christ, because he was not the mighty warrior that the scriptures said he would be. That's because there was another work that had to be done. And that other work was to bring many sons to glory. That's what he's talking about up here in chapter 8. Verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom I am has given me are signs and portents in Israel from I am of hosts. I and the children whom I am has giving, given me. Jesus was the first of the first fruits. But in the last 2,000 years, he has been raising up sons to his father. These sons are his brothers and also considered his children. Isaiah 9, 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called 
wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. Well, see, it sounds too wonderful to apply to a mere mortal. Let me take you to the book of Habakkuk. I'm sorry, Obadiah. Obadiah is one chapter. Starting with verse 17. But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. This is referring to New Jerusalem. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, because the oil in us will burn. And the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau a stubble. Esau represents man without Christ. He will be burnt as stubble. Because the fire of God, the word of God, will burn him in order to finally bring them in. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor of the house of Esau, for I am has spoken. Why, how can that be? Doesn't it sound, that sounds like eternal torment or eternal destruction, doesn't it? It's talking about burning the flesh. There will be no survivor, ultimately, of the house of Esau. There will be no natural man left because all will be consumed by the fire of God's word. Those of the Najeb shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim, the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites, as far as Zarephath and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Zephyrad shall possess the cities of the Najeb. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau and the kingdom shall be I am's. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion. The city of God, New Jerusalem, will consist of saviors, of those who have been fully made into God's image. And therefore, you go back to Isaiah chapter 9, and you understand, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We are identified with our brother, with our elder brother. We are identified with Christ. We are the sons that have been given to him. Go back to Obadiah. Savior shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau. Mount Esau is the kingdom of man. Saviors, those who are glorified, will rule the world. It was not time when Jesus first came. It is almost time. I don't know when this birthing will occur, but it is close at hand. So you sons of God in the making, 
be not offended. The kingdom will be the Lord's. Endure until the end, just like John the Baptist did.